2, Luke chapter 2, and um, let's see here. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 35 tonight. Luke chapter 2, and ask that you go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's Word, as is our custom. Give you a chance to stretch your legs, because we're going to be here a while. I'm kidding. But Luke chapter 2, and uh, starting at verse 21, we'll read these verses responsibly. So I'll begin in verse 21, you'll join me on 22, and so forth. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child... His name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to all of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As is written the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy, thou, thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to, the Genti light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people. It, thy, boy, I tell you what, we'll get it straight eventually. All right. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Read the last with me, please. Yea, the sword shall pierce thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Father, I pray that you bless now the preaching of your word. Help us to receive something from it. Give us guidance and understanding. I ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead and be seated. And uh, I want to talk to you today, tonight, about this man, Simeon. I don't really have a, a title in place, so I guess I'll just say to you, uh, you've heard the phrase, we sing this, well, we don't sing the song, I guess, but the, you've heard the phrase, dare to be a Daniel and whatnot, and a lot long ago, it might be long ago, I preached a message on dare to be a Timothy, uh, so I guess we could call it dare to be a Simeon, I don't know, but I want to talk about Simeon tonight and the kind of character that he had, and I want us to examine our own lives, I want to examine my life and see if I measure up to Simeon, and, and I want you to see your life and see how you might measure up to Simeon, and please don't misunderstand me obviously I'm not uh, encouraging you to compare yourself by you know by others and so forth uh, but Simeon had a great testimony I believe and uh, and I want to just share some highlights about that uh, before I do I'll set the scene and of course the last several Sunday nights we've been talking uh, through the book of Luke and again I don't know that this is going to turn into a series so far it seems to be uh, but as we see this uh, setting the scene earlier in Luke chapter 2 we find in verses 1 and 3 that Caesar Augustus the Roman emperor issued a decree that the whole world should be taxed. And we also understand that that meant that there would be a census that would take place, which was why they had to leave wherever they were and go to the land or the area where their patronage or their father uh, was from. And so then in verses 4 and 5, we see that Joseph and Mary went together to be taxed in the city of Joseph's ancestor known as Bethlehem. Also, as we hear, it's called the city of David. And, and the reason it's called the city of David is because that's where David was from. Although we also find Jerusalem is called the city of David because that's a city that, uh, that David took over and so forth and set up the throne and all that stuff. Uh, but so anyways, Joseph and Mary, they went to be taxed in the city of Bethlehem, which helped make the prophecy be fulfilled that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, that we find in the book of Micah. Then in verses 6 and 7, we see that Mary had the baby, and uh, she laid him in a manger. As the Bible says, there was no room for him in the inn. 
And then in verses 8 through 17, the shepherds received the message of Jesus' birth. They made a visit to where Jesus was. And then they went abroad telling others. And when it was all said and done, they came back uh, rejoicing and joying in the Lord and what they had seen and what they had heard and what they had witnessed with themselves. Then in verse 21, where we picked it up here this evening, we find that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, which was part of their Jewish law. And you understand, again, they are still under the law at this point. That's not taken care of until Jesus has actually die, died, was buried, and rose again, and His blood was applied to the mercy seat. And so here they are under the law, and He's being circumcised, as all Jewish boys were, on the eighth day. In verses 22 and 24, we see that Mary was considered, under the law, was considered ceremoniously impure. In fact, she's ceremoniously impure for 40 days uh, after the birth of a male child, is what you learn in the law. And as a result, she could not enter the temple as sacrifice was to be offered. And in this case... Uh, we understand that she that they offered a sacrifice of a poorer person that a poorer person would offer, and so in verses 22 through 24 it says. Um, well, actually, I'll pick it up at verse 22. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. You also find in, some, uh, in the law, this is also where they would pay uh, five shekels of silver uh, as a, uh, as a uh, atonement price uh, for a male child. And so, in verse 21, he was eight days old. But now, by the time we get to verses 22 and 24, more time has passed. And the reason we know this is because based on the law, she wouldn't be there until 40 days after uh, um, uh, Jesus was born. And so, nonetheless, here they are in the temple to present Him before the Lord and to offer a sacrifice as it is according to the law. And then we see Simeon. And Simeon enters the picture. And we don't really know a lot about Simeon besides what is written here in the text of Luke chapter 2. We don't know... Uh, that he was a priest, or a Levite, or a scribe, or a ruler. Uh, all we know about Simeon was that he was a godly man, and that he went to the temple that day. Uh, very possibly, he's someone that we would call maybe a layman. Uh, he was just he was this year uh, just another Jew, but a godly Jew, a devout Jew, and, and someone who served the Lord, loved the Lord. But we have no reason to believe that he was a priest or a Levite. He might have been. The Bible doesn't say. Uh, and, uh, and I get the impression, uh, to me, I get the impression of the way the Holy Spirit was leading him, that uh, his visit to the temple was not necessarily a daily occurrence, uh, but that he was led to the temple this particular day because Jesus would be there. And we'll see that as we get into the message. Uh, but if he was not, uh, for instance, a priest or a Levite or a scribe or a ruler, this certainly can remind us that, uh, that a person does not have to have a bunch of degrees or, or titles uh, or whatever to the back of his name in order, or in the front of his name in order to be used of God. Uh, simply put, if you want to be used of God, you just have to be godly and you have to serve Him faithfully and God will use you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your walk of life is. It doesn't matter what your educational background is. If you simply desire to be a godly person, live a godly life, and you serve Him faithfully, Safely, God will use you. And the truth is, God is just looking for some people that are willing to be used of Him. Uh, he says, uh, I saw for a man to stand in the gap and I found none. He's just looking for someone that's willing to say, hey, I'll stand in the gap. I'll step up to the plate. I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. And of course, the prerequisite, as I also said, that a person should be godly. And, uh, and so we find this about Simeon. Well, so let's look at uh, some characteristics that God uses, the words that God uses to describe Simeon. In verse 25, the Bible says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was, and here's the first descriptive word about him, he was just. He was a just man. Now that word just, uh, it basically means, in the primary, it means some, something that is straight or close uh, from the sense of a setting, uh, it means someone, uh, uh, in fact, the word just means regular or orderly, it means due or suitable, he was a, he was an orderly man, he was a suitable man, uh, but it also means 
was exactly proportioned or proper. So he was a proper man. He was just, he was honest, he was fair, he was orderly, he was proper. It means full or complete uh, to the common standard. It means to, uh, uh, the word just means full or true. In a sense, an uh, ally to the preceding or the same. In a moral sense, it's someone who is upright or honest, having principles, and, uh, and someone who was, uh, in fact, in the evan evangelical sense, it means to be righteous or to be religious or influenced by regard to the laws of God. And so when the Bible says that he was a just man, it means that he was a man that did right. He was a man that lived honest. He was a man that lived pure. He was a man that conformed to the rules of God. He was a man that conformed to the truth of things. The Greek word is the word diakios, or something along that line, and it's found 81 times in your Bible. And interestingly enough, um, you see here, 41 of those times is translated as the word righteous. And so just and righteous, in many respects, uh, coincide with each other. And so it talks about him being a just man. He was a righteous man. He was a man that did right. And uh, the word is also translated as just 33 times. It's translated as right five times in the sense of something that is suitable. It's right to be done. It's translated as the word meet, M-E-E-T, as something that is acceptable. And so this word just means that he was a righteous man. May I say to you that a man who is righteous in the Bible is not necessarily referring to someone who is sinless. I'm not saying that Simeon was a sinless man. I'm saying he was a just man. A man who is righteous is a man who is first right with God. You understand you cannot be righteous or do right or live right if you're not right with God. In fact, anything that is not right with God automatically disqualifies itself as being righteous or just. And so... Uh, those who have had the righteousness of God imputed to them uh, certainly should then live by faith. As we're told in the Bible four times, the just shall live by faith. That's how they're going to live. The just shall live by faith. But you understand that in order to be righteous in a spiritual sense, uh, it comes through Christ. The Bible tells us in several places, I'll read them to you, uh, most of them are in Romans chapter 4, it says in Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And why was it counted to Abraham for righteousness? Because he put his faith in God, he believed God. Verse 5 of that same passage says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. In verse 9 it says, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. In verse 22 it says, And therefore is imputed to him for righteousness. Romans 10, 4 it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You see, that's the key. You cannot have God's righteousness outside of faith. It's for everyone that believeth. Certainly Simeon was a man that believed God. And we can see that clearly in the text. In Galatians in chapter 3, in verse 6, it says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. James 2.23 says, And the scripture was fulfilled, but say it, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. And so those who have trusted Christ as their Savior should not stop living righteously by faith. In fact, we're told that we're supposed to walk by faith. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says that uh, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I believe that describes the life of the man that we know of as Simeon. But he was a just man. He was a righteous man. And that righteousness that he had was first and foremost based on the fact that he believed God. He believed that God was going to bring the consolation of Israel. He believed that God was going to cause him to live until such time as he saw the consolation of Israel. But I also believe that the 
that word just doesn't just describe the fact that he believed God, I believe it also describes a lifestyle. And certainly you and I ought to have a lifestyle of justiceness, a lifestyle of righteousness. We ought to live the righteousness that God has deemed us to be. The next term we find in our passage, in verse 25, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same was just and devout. And so first we learn that he was a just man, but then we learn that he was a devout man. That word devout simply means yielding a solemn and reverential attention to God in religious exercises, particularly in prayer. It means pious, devoted to religion or religious. For instance, in Acts in chapter 8, when Stephen was thrown to death, the Bible says devout men carried Stephen to his burial. Uh, and these would be his brothers and sisters in Christ, or his brothers in Christ. The word devout means expressing devotion or piety as with eyes devout. It means to be sincere or solemn or earnest as you have my devout wishes for your safety. It means uh, an unused way today, but it means a devotee or someone who is devoted to something else or someone else. And so I see here that not only was Simeon a righteous man or a just man, but he was a devout man, meaning that he was serious about his commitment to God. You understand he was devoted to God. God had his devotion. He was a devout man in the fact that he was very serious about his faith. He was serious about his quote unquote religion. Should not you and I today be serious about our Christian walk? As we talked about this morning, should we not be serious about our time in the Word and our life in the Bible? Should we not be serious in our, our daily walk and our daily uh, journey on this earth? Should we not be devout when it comes to our worship of our Lord and Savior? He was reverent. He reverenced God. He was devout and holy in that respect. May I say then that we should practice uh, the presence of our Savior, listening for Him and talking to Him. 365 days a year, and I believe this year we get 366 days to do it. And so, however, uh, first it's okay, uh, Brother Gus, one of his favorite songs is In the Garden. I come to the garden alone, and so forth. And, uh, and the words go like this, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none ever, none other has ever known. We sing that song, but my question is, do we practice it? You see, Simeon was a just man. Uh, and I believe that's how he was uh, in the sense of with people around him. But he was also a devout man, meaning that he cherished his relationship with God. And he had the mindset that we have when we sing that song, he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Do you enjoy the presence of God? You see, that's a devout man. What or whom has your devotion? Where does your devotion lie? Where does my devotion lie? Where devotion is talking about a state of being uh, dedicated or consecrated or solemnly set apart for a particular purpose. And uh, a solemn attention to a supreme being in worship. Uh, uh, in Acts 17, uh, Paul is preaching and he uses the terminology. He says, I pass by and beheld your devotions. Of course, their devotions was something that I ought not to be to. And he was trying to gear them away from that so that they might have their devotions to God. But the question is, to whom are you devoted? Simeon was a just man. He was a devout man. What else do we see in our text about Simeon? Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was a just, and was just and devout. And the next word is waiting. He was a waiting man. Simeon was waiting. When I read that, and we talked about this in Sunday school about uh, a year, months ago now, blessed are they that wait for the Lord, and blessed are they that wait 
on the Lord, and we looked at the differences between the two, both phrases are found in the Bible, and we looked at the differences between the two, the difference between waiting on somebody and waiting for somebody, and both are important. We ought to wait on the Lord, which would be serving Him, and we ought to wait for the Lord, which would be an expectation of Him. And uh, and I used the illustration if I was if my children were in school and and uh, we uh, in this area I noticed uh, a lot of times people drive to a spot where the kids can be dropped off from the bus and they take the kids home after that and uh, and that first day of, of school the bus system got kind of messed up and the buses were running behind and and uh, I saw you know people parked and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for what they were waiting for their kids. And uh, they kept waiting. Why? Because they had a reasonable expectation that the bus would arrive and the children would be dropped off. If they stopped waiting for their kids and had left, eventually the bus would have shown up, but they would not have been picked up by their parents. You understand this idea of waiting as he was waiting on the consolation or waiting for the consolation of Israel. This denotes an idea of expectation, a looking toward. He was looking forward to the fact that Jesus would be born. He was looking forward to the fact that a Messiah would be born. But you understand this waiting denotes faith. He is waiting expecting it to be so. He believed with all his heart that God was going to bring the Messiah during his lifetime because the Holy Ghost of God told him so and so he just expected it and he was just waiting. Waiting patiently I assume. Waiting without knowing when it would happen but waiting expectantly believing. So who was Simeon waiting for? And the Bible says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And who or what is that? And you know the answer that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Prophecy concerning Israel's Messiah was close to the time of fulfillment. And Simeon seemed evidently to know this. And so he was waiting for Israel's Messiah. The word consolation simply means a comfort, an alleviation of misery. You understand that the Jews at this time... Most of their history throughout the world history for that matter. But this time they were under great oppression. They were under great misery. And Jesus was going to come and eventually offer to set that all straight. Now we understand that ultimately they, re they, they rejected him. And, uh, and as a result, well, here we are today. And uh, there will be another opportunity for them. But many of them are going to be persecuted and die off long before that. Uh, but nonetheless, he was there to alleviate them. Jesus was the consolation of Israel. Uh, he's also my consolation, amen? And so, just as Simeon was waiting for the first coming of Jesus, the Messiah, should we not also be waiting for his next coming? Amen. The Bible says in <clears throat> Titus, in chapter 2, you are going to turn there, there are several verses I'll be looking at. Titus chapter 2. It says in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. It's talking about Jesus Christ. It's already happened. Verse 12. Teaching us this grace. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We shall live soberly. Righteously. And godly in this present world. You say, oh, you just don't understand what kind of a world we live in today. It's really bad in 2020 compared to when it was in the day that Titus, this, this was written. Oh, it's not. It was bad then too. You know, we see more of it. And I do believe that there's some truth to the idea. Well, not truth to the idea. I do believe the Bible teaches it's going to get worse and worse. I understand that. But when this was written, I believe that God knew full well that our present world would be different than their present world. And so even if Simeon was living in a time where they needed great consolation, we see that he was a just and devout man while he was waiting on the consolation of Israel. He wasn't a worldly reprobate while he was waiting for the consolation. He was a just and devout man. And I say we all 
to also be justified about while we're waiting on the Lord. As the scripture says here, that we ought to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Looking, verse 13, for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Knowing that Jesus is coming back. Talking about those of our little before church. And, and I was joking a little bit with them. And I asked them, do you know when the rapture is going to take place? And uh, and they both said, well, no one knows when the rapture is going to take place. Because, you know, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. And I said, you're right. No man knoweth the day nor the hour. So it's going to be at night and on the half hour. Amen. And uh, and furthermore, no man knows. So maybe a woman does. I don't know. They seem to think they know everything anyway. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh now I'm in trouble now. Uh, but but uh, we were talking about that. And then he said, but I do think it's going to be soon. And you know something, brother? So do I. I think it could be any moment now. In a twinkling of an eye. It surely could be. But here we're told that as we wait for this, and we wait for him to come, and we wait for the return of Jesus Christ, we ought to be unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And so, I believe that's what Simeon was like. He was a just and devout man while he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Do you think there's a possibility that his just and devoutness, uh, his being righteous and devout, has something to do with the fact that he was expecting Jesus to come? Not necessarily knowing him as that name, but expecting the Messiah to come? It might have had something to do with it. I don't know. He might have just had a good character. I don't know. But as much as I do know, Jesus is coming back. And if he comes back tonight, what is he going to find with you and I? And so... We find that Simeon, he was, he was just, he was devout, he was waiting, and then I say to you, he was led. In verse 25 of our text, the Bible says, at the very end, just and devout, this is Luke 2 again, he was just and devout, waiting on the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost. Was upon him. Simeon was led. The Bible says the Holy Ghost was upon him. The Holy Ghost rested upon Simeon. Today you and I as children of God. The Holy Spirit of God is dwelling. Living inside of us. Today we are filled. Or we ought to be filled. And controlled by the Holy Spirit. Just as the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. And spoke to Simeon. And led Simeon. And guided Simeon. You and I ought to also have the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. Right. Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. See, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. In other words, as we talked about in the book of Proverbs, hearing the instruction of the Lord and then doing the instruction of the Lord. Not as fools, <laughs> but as wise. He says, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, but be ye, we in his excess, but be ye, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things under God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one for another in the fear of God. You understand, you and I, we ought to be led of the Spirit. We ought to uh, not be fools, but be wise. We ought to walk circumspectly. We ought to redeem the time, seeing the days are evil. And uh, we ought to understand what the will of the Lord is. And in understanding that, we ought not to be drunk with wine, where it is excess, but rather we ought to be filled with the Spirit. We ought to be controlled by the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. Galatians 5.16 says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I've said this before, I think recently in our Roman series, but the, 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 the fact of the matter is, if you're walking in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And if you feel, fulfill the lust of the flesh, you're not walking in the Spirit. It's, just, it's, it's a zero sum. It's either one or the other. It can't be both. And so Simeon, the Bible says, the end of verse 25, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Verse 26, it says, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost 
that he should not see death before that he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so not only do we see that he was led of the Spirit and that the Holy Spirit of God was upon him, we also find that the Holy Ghost had told Simeon that death would not come until Simeon had seen the Messiah. And he, we know, believed this because the Bible says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And so, today, God's Holy Spirit is still involved in a teaching ministry. John 16 tells us in verse 13 that the Holy Spirit will guide us or teach us all things and guide us in all truth. And as we study God's Word, as we hear God's words preached, as we pray, as we seek Him, the Holy Spirit will instruct us. In verse 27 it says, And He came, Simeon, and He came by the Spirit into the temple. This is why I do not believe this was necessarily a normal act for Him. Not that He would never go to the temple, but they, don't, they didn't go to the temple necessarily every day. But I believe that he showed up at the temple that day because there was a leading upon him by the Holy Spirit of God. He might not have understood everything that was involved in it. He might have been in his home. He might have been in his garden. He might have been helping someone by the wayside. I don't know what he was doing. But he had the strong impression by the Holy Spirit of God that he needed to go to the temple. And we find that he was obedient to that calling or to that drawing or to that leading. And he came by the Spirit in the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took him up, he him up in his arms, and blessed God and said, and we read what he said, we'll see that in a moment. But here we find the Holy Spirit guided Simeon to be in the right place at the right time and led him to the right child. Amen. How many of you would love it if God were to lead you that way? If God would just direct your steps? If he would, oh, I don't know, the Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. If he would guide and direct your steps, we know that the scriptures tell us, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. And we find that we're, we're ordered and directed and guided and lit, the, the path is lit for us by being in the word of God. Certainly that is true. And I believe one reason why that is true is when we're in the word of God, the Holy Spirit of God is able to teach us the things of God and guide us in the proper path. Oh, that we could just be led by the Spirit on a regular basis. Oh, that we could just know the mind of God. I believe it's His desire to share it with us. And it might seem somewhat, oh, this word is not the word I want. It's the best one I can come up with. But, you know, spooky. Uh, that's not the best word. But, you know, supernatural. That's certainly a good word because it is supernatural. But it's real. And I believe that we can be led of the Spirit. I believe we can have divine appointments. I believe that God can direct our steps. That although we might not know why we have this impression or this desire or this need to go a particular path, that we're attuned to the Word of God, we're attuned to the Spirit of God, we follow that path. And eventually we find out why we went down that path. The Simeon was led. And as we're guided by God, if we allow ourselves to be guided by God, we also will be in the right place and at the right time. Yeah. And so, Simeon, he was just, he was devout, he was waiting, he was led. We find in verse 28 that he was grateful. <coughs> then took he, him up, took he him up in his arms and blessed God. The Bible says he blessed God. He showed his gratitude. I don't know how long he had been waiting. The impression is that he was up in age. And uh, he was told, you're not going to die until you see the Lord's Christ. I'm not sure how long this has been. I don't know how long he knew that. But here he is on this day like any other day. But he has this impression, this desire, this need, this, this leading of the Holy Spirit to go into the temple. Did he know that this was the day that he would meet the Messiah? I don't know. All I know is he went to the temple. And maybe he was wondering what God was going to do and why God wanted him at the temple at that time and that day. He walks into the temple and he's there. And next thing you know, this young couple walks in with a little boy. And as they walk in to do that five shekels, I think it is, of silver and to offer the sacrifice and to do what was a part of their, their Jewish custom and so forth, he saw the little boy and immediately everything came together and he reached out and he picked up the child and he held the child everywhere and began to bless God. Oh, thank you God for fulfilling your word. Thank you God 
for using me. Thank you, God, for letting my eyes see the hope of Israel, the salvation of the Lord. He was grateful. He showed his gratitude. He had seen the Lord's salvation in person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that God was faithful to Israel. He knew that God was faithful to keep his promises. And he had much for which to be grateful. And he knew it. You understand when we fail to look around and God continues to bless us. We often fail to recognize just how good God has been to us. And oftentimes we fail just to say something as simple as thank you. We spend all of our time in prayer asking for things and we're told we have not because we ask not. And we're told that we are supposed to ask. But we're also told that he knows what we need before we even ask him. I wonder how much time we spend in prayer just simply thanking him. Just simply thanking him. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. Lastly tonight, Simeon was submissive. <clears throat> In verse 29, he says, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. He said, Lord, now let thy servant. Now. Not tomorrow. Not yesterday. But now. You see, he was ready to go according to the plan of God. God said, you're going to live until you see the promised one. He got to see the promise of what he said, Now, Lord, now let me depart in peace. There was no complaints, no begging God for more time. He had seen what God had promised, and he was satisfied. Can we simply be satisfied with God and what he's promised us? Now, Lord. We also see the word Lord. Lord, now. Let us thy servant. And as Lord, Simeon recognized that God was his absolute owner. God was his owner. I don't know why we rough our feathers at that. No one owns me. God does. Amen. God does. You think of yourself. Can you say that God has rights of ownership in your life? I believe he does. The question is, do we admit it? Do we submit to it? See, God owns you for no other reason, for no other reason, because he created you. And as your creator, he has every right to your life. I heard an illustration about a man that, you know, he was a watchmaker. This is a cheap Kmart watch when Kmart was still in business here. And, um, but he was a watchmaker. And he would spend hours in intricate detail. And the watches he made, they could certainly be sold for, you know, hundreds or thousands or whatever. This was maybe eight bucks, okay? But he could he could do, you know, miraculous things with that watch. And uh, the story goes, I don't know if it's a true story, but it's a good illustration. And the story goes that he made a watch and it worked perfectly well. And uh, but he was trying to teach a lesson to somebody. And so he took the watch and he sat it on the table, and he asked the person he was speaking to, who made that watch? And the person said, well, you did. That's right. So does that mean I can do whatever I want with that watch? Well, I suppose you can. And he reached down in his work desk, and he pulled out a hammer and just smashed the thing to pieces. And the man was like, how could you do that? This was a beautiful work. He said, it's my watch. I can do what I want with it. I made it. And that's what you are a God. Now, I'm not saying that God's going to take a hammer and smash you to pieces, but my point is, you are his creation. And he has every right to do with you as he pleases. Every right. I think of the man that was born blind. And the disciples asked the question, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Which I always, and I say this to you before, but I always find that interesting. How could the man have sinned to cause himself to be born blind? He sinned before he was, you know, that didn't make sense to me, but whatever. Who, who sinned? And that was a, that was a, Common belief in those days, somewhat superstitious. 
And God said, Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but he was born blind for one reason, that the works of God may be made manifest in that God would receive glory. You understand that God created him blind for God's own purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And that's okay. I don't know what God created you for, but it's for his own purpose. And it would do you and me well if we would just learn to submit to that. Yeah. But not only does he have the rights of ownership to you because of your, you being his creation, he doubly has rights of ownership to you because of your redemption. The Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we've been bought with a price. And I don't think there's a person here that's foolish enough to say, well, if I had known that, I would have accepted Jesus as my Savior. In fact, I want him to, I'd rather he take away my salvation so I can have my own life back. That would be pretty foolish. But the truth is, he owns you because of creation. And he owns you because of redemption. You're doubly his. <clears throat> so we need to submit. Simeon, he was just. Or righteous. He was devout. He was waiting. It shows an idea of faith. He was led of the Spirit. He was grateful to the promises of God being fulfilled in his life. And he was submissive. And we look at Simeon and we think, wow, what a what a good man. Don't know much about him beyond this. But we look at him and think, wow, something. That God would tell you, and he got to see the Messiah, and he got to prophesy about who the Messiah is. Well, listen, church, you and I have the same opportunity every single day of our life to be just and devout and waiting and led and grateful and submissive. You can be a Simeon every single day of your life. And then, when it's all over, You'll be able to say, Lord, now, Lord, now, let us, thou thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. Father, we love you. We ask for your blessings. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's the plan. Altar is open.